My name is Rachel Moore. I have a background in marine biology and have spent years studying and photographing the life within our ocean. I've always been a relentlessly curious person, especially when it comes to science in the ocean. When everything is in perfect balance and there's an abundance of life, it's the most beautiful and strange place on Earth. I have lived in French Polynesia for five years now, and in just that short period of time, I've seen a dramatic and frightening change in the ecosystem. This seemingly foreign world is far more closely tied to our lives on land than we ever could have imagined. Our lives have pushed theirs to a tipping point. So here we are. Today, it's rare to hear from scientists in a way that's easily accessible to the general population, especially when scientists are so deeply involved in their work. It's my goal to help document and share their research and knowledge in hopes of inspiring others to learn more and protect our ocean. From the smallest of sea creatures, to monolithic mammals. We'll be diving into the reality of climate change and how it is and will be affecting all of their lives. This team of scientists have an underwater nursery where they're able to grow and monitor different types of corals in a relatively controlled environment. This allows them to compare their results with corals grown in the lab and see which corals are best able to survive the stresses of climate change. Coral spawning is a process by which coral reefs reproduce. It typically occurs once a year at a specific time, usually in synchrony with the lunar cycle. We just happened to be at the lab when this special event took place. So this is the experimental zone of the Creope. This is where we keep the live animals. So we have all the corals in the tanks and hopefully they're going to be ready to spawn tonight. So I can measure actually how many eggs are going to come out of it. So like how many eggs per square centimeter of coral. During coral spawning, adult coral colonies release their gametes, which are their reproductive cells, into the water where they combine to form new baby corals. One of the experiments in the lab is designed to figure out how to breed corals that have survived previous bleaching events to hopefully create super corals that will be more resistant to climate change. So what we found is that when we cross specific corals, we make larvae that are more resistant to heat stress, for instance, or acidity stress, which can be also an impact of uh, climate change. Clownfish with their vibrant orange and white stripes are an iconic species of coral reefs. These small but fiery fish have a unique symbiotic relationship with sea anemones. Here, they're able to find protection from predators and a source of food. I could never be an actor or a, a, or a politician. This is Dr. Suzanne Mills. She's studying clownfish yeah. as they're a great indicator species for the reef. I want to see whether organisms can cope with environmental changes, mainly caused by humans, and if they can cope, what mechanism do they use? And what's cool about corals and anemones is that they have so many other fish and shrimps and crabs living inside them. And so not many people have looked at the impacts on them. They just focused on the corals. Since clownfish are so similar to other species of tropical fish, the data collected from these studies can be applied to a fifth of all fish species living on the reef. So what we found that um, climate change impacts the reproduction of clownfish means that it could also impact the reproduction of a fifth of the species on the reef. Crown of thorns are a species of starfish that live in coral reefs throughout the Indo-Pacific. They are most known for their venomous spines. Crown of thorns feed mostly on coral polyps. A single starfish can consume up to six square meters of coral reef per year. Their life cycle is this boom and bust. So they have two phases where they can live individually in very small numbers. They're a natural part of the reef. They're not invasive or anything. But some period of, in time, they, they have this boom population where their numbers just explode exponentially. And they're often seen coming up deep from the reef like an army. The worry is, the last time there was an outbreak of crown of thorns in Morea, they devastated 90% of the reef. The reef did slowly come back. It took between 10 to 13 years. But what we're worried about now is that there's so many other stresses with the climate change, pollution, that the, just, the reef just won't be able to come back from it. Control measures include manual removal, biological and chemical controls. But these need to be carefully planned and done by experts to avoid doing more harm to the reef. 
These outbreaks can be caused by a variety of factors, such as overfishing of their natural predators, nutrient pollution, and global warming. While they are a natural part of the ecosystem, they can be an extremely destructive force when their populations become imbalanced. I still have hope because my work on clownfish and other species have showed me that um, species can cope. They're resilient to changes. They can modify their behavior or their morphology or their physiology to cope with the changes. And maybe that gives them a bit of time to make genetic changes that will um, help them in the long term. For 450 million years, sharks have been the apex predators of the aquatic world, keeping all marine ecosystems in balance. These evolutionary masterpieces have survived the last five mass extinction events. But somehow, even with all their instinctual knowledge, now find themselves in danger. This is Dr. Jody Rummer of James Cook University. She's investigating how climate change impacts the physiology of newborn and juvenile reef sharks. And not only am I a professor of marine biology, but I'm also the founder and the chief scientist of the PhysioShark Research Program. The PhysioShark team is collecting the information needed to not only better understand the life cycle of these animals, but also how we might better manage and protect areas of our oceans. Now we're here in French Polynesia for a very special reason to do this research, because it is a shark sanctuary. So 4.8 million square kilometers of ocean is protected for sharks from fishing, from any form of exploitation. So that allows us to focus on the next really big threat that sharks are facing, and that's climate change. Techniques that we're using come from physiology, come from a lot of human studies. We'll take maybe a blood sample, we'll use an ultrasound, we'll look at how big their liver is, how much energy they have stored in their body that's gonna get them by while they're learning how to essentially be a shark in these shallow nursery habitats. We're trying to measure and understand how fast they're using this energy source. And of course, this is going to be utilized much more quickly under elevated temperatures as well. So it has a, a lot of climate change relevance. They're gonna be using these energy stores much more rapidly under warmer conditions. Their research continues to emphasize the importance of protected areas in shark sanctuaries giving these critical species time to better adapt to the threat of climate change. Whales have been exploring this planet's ever-changing oceans for nearly 50 million years. After being nearly hunted to extinction by whaling fleets, they are just now starting to make their comeback. However, they still face threats, once again caused by humans. Dr. Michael Poole has been studying whales in the South Pacific for over 35 years. His research is showing that even these magnificent giants will be affected by climate change. Worldwide, everywhere, all life forms, whether terrestrial on land or aquatic in the water, their greatest threat is habitat loss. With climate change, the forecasts are for certain increases in temperature in these breeding grounds that go beyond the range of what whales are using now. At that point, it could mean that they have a few different choices, adapt to the warmer temperatures and still use those same breeding grounds or leave those breeding grounds and have to go somewhere else. Our ocean's ecosystems are under threat from pollution, climate change, overfishing, and a number of other human-caused stresses. Marine biologists are on the front lines working tirelessly to understand and protect these fragile ecosystems. What gives me hope? Okay, that's a good question. I'm the eternal optimist in spite of everything. And so our efforts are to conserve spaces and species. I see that a lot more young people care about the environment and they want to do their part. Well, I know personally, sometimes I feel like I'm just one individual and that I don't make a huge difference alone. But I do know that every action that I make, every dollar that I spend is a vote. And that vote can be in a positive direction and in a direction for a healthy planet. Through their tireless research and dedication, we can gain a better understanding of what is required for the survival of the life within our ocean. But we have to make sacrifices, yeah. And help us take action to safeguard these precious ecosystems. Too often we think of nature as being separate from ourselves. We forget that every change, every action, 
whether positive or negative, has repercussions. We need to learn from these scientists because their knowledge applies on a global scale. We need to work together to help to ensure that our only planet thrives for future generations and all species. <laughs>